the Mac Observer's Mac Geek App, episode 718 for Monday, July 16th, 2018. And welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where we take all kinds of information, your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found, our cool stuff found, our tips. We mix it all together. The goal, you know, we're, we're past the halfway point of uh, 2018 now. The goal this year is that each of us learns five new things, at least every single time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include... BB Edit from Bare Bones Software, and also Ring with their doorbells and floodlight cameras and more. And I've got a deal where you can save up to 150 bucks on a rig of security kit. We'll talk all about that in a little bit. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fearful, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. How you doing, Mr. John F. Braun? <sighs> Yeah, things are kind of going up and down and up and down and up and down. <laughs> yeah, you have a uh, you have a strange Wi-Fi connection to our Discord uh, server today. You keep you keep losing connection. You're the only one I podcast with that, that where that's been happening for the last couple of weeks. So I have to assume that you've got some weird networking things on your end. Wow, I don't know. Maybe it's one of those uh, beta Eero Lab features I enabled. I don't know. Oh, you know, it could be. Huh? Well, no, but this machine's wired, so that's not well, it. Well, yeah, but that would, uh, the Eero Labs features, one of them is the, the QoS, right? They call it smart queue management. So uh -huh. that, that affects everything, right? That's that's just a routing thing. What are the other Eero Labs features? Remind me of this, John. Uh, band steering. Yeah, that's just Wi-Fi, right? And then DNS caching. Yeah. Yeah, that would affect the whole network, but shouldn't affect your thing. Well, it'd be interesting if you turned off smart queue management, if that, but I, but SQM, no, SQM you've had on for a long time. Like that has existed oh, yeah. since before WWDC and we've never had a problem. So yeah, yeah, no, it's just, and I look here and it shows no packet loss with you anymore. So fascinating, fascinating, yeah. fascinating, my friend. Well, uh, you know, it's so we're recording this episode well in advance. In fact, uh, it's just after July 4th that we are doing this recording because we've got some travel. I have some initially and then John's got some. And so we are. In fact, John, you'll see everybody this coming weekend that's going to Mac stock. Isn't that right? Yeah, it's coming up. That's awesome, man. Yeah, my my family travel as it did two years ago will uh, cause me to miss this Mac stock, which is unfortunate because I always really like to get to see everybody. It's it's a great community of, of all of you with us, all of us together. So, yeah. But John, you'll be there. That's good. Are you speaking this year? Or are you... Uh you're no. you'll be you'll be speaking just not on on stage you'll you'll you're not going to go i'm not a speaker but correct. i will certainly be speaking hmm. so if someone were to come up to you and say hello you would you would you i would, would acknowledge would, their presence and but you would voice your reply you wouldn't just like like hand write a reply or something like that so that's great that's good uh yeah good all right so the the thing today though is that you know, we figured as we like to do sometimes, John, let me see if I can turn up the reverb here and, and make this work the right way. It's time for a deep, deep, deep dive. Yeah. Thanks to, uh, I think it was Ev who made that, that little thing for us. So, uh, we've got time for, oh, the reverb's still a little hot. We've got time for a couple of deep dives today, John. I think we've had a lot of questions about photos. We've had a lot of questions about like NAS with backups and Synology. And, uh, and then if we've got time, we've been saving some of your Wi-Fi and networking questions too. So why don't we start here with photos and see where we get? That sounds good. Sound good to you, John? Mm-hmm. Okay. Starting with Albert. Albert asks, he says, um, I'm previously a Windows guy, basically a computer nerd, but I bought my wife her first MacBook Pro off of Facebook recently. And uh, he says, uh, I need help finding programs to get her started on light photo and video editing. 
I know that the processor is going to be a bottleneck. It's an older machine, uh, but she should be able to do some editing, right? My wife has a Google Pixel smartphone for taking sm uh, videos and photos, and she wants to be able to edit and then post videos on YouTube. So um, this is, I, I love start, this is, I, I picked this to start with because there are lot there are lots of programs out there that we know about to do editing, specifically photo editing, uh, that are, you know, sort of very heavyweight things like Photoshop is the first that would come to mind. But I never use Photoshop anymore, John. Um, I didn't use it a whole lot when it was the only thing that I had to use because it was all, always very confusing to me. But certainly now that there are other options out there, I definitely don't use it. Uh, there are really two that come to mind. And the one that I use all the time is called Pixelmator. Um, Pixelmator, it, like, I can't say enough good things about it. It is very lightweight. It's very, very compared to, especially compared to Photoshop, very low cost, right? I mean, I, well, Pixelmator Pro is available in the app store. That's $59.99, but I think regular Pixelmator is still available on their website for quite a bit less than that. Oh, where is it? It's not going to show me the price because... I can't because I've already bought it, uh, but I'll find the price. Um, and it and it's like it's super lightweight in terms of just like doesn't use a lot of processing horsepower or anything like that. Uh, it's twenty nine ninety nine uh, in the App Store in the Mac App Store, but it does everything I would ever want to do with images and so much more. In fact, there are people that I know that are Photoshop, you know, diehards that that have used Photoshop for decades. And very quickly switched over to Pixelmator once they first used it, just because it's so much easier to use. It's so efficient. It's it it, it, it and it makes life easy. Like you know, it, it's got like you can paste things in. You can work in layers, which is really helpful when you're doing different things with photos, especially editing. Um, and and you can highlight colors and replace colors, and everything just works really, really well. And as Brian Monroe in our chat room points out. Uh, chat rooms at macgeekgab.com slash stream. Thank you and welcome. Uh, it also works on iOS and I've done some great edits on my iPhone with Pixelmator. So it's really worth checking out and and one of my favorite apps to 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 use. In fact, I use it for every Mac Geek Cab. It's where I make our uh, all our, our show images and, and that sort of thing. In fact, if you look at the show image for the last episode for 717, you, there's a little Easter egg buried in there. So maybe you'll see it. So that's, uh, that's one. What, what do you use anything for, you know, image manipulation or things like that, John? I have another one to, to mention, but, but I figure we'll throw it back and forth here. I mean, I used to run Aperture, but that's of course, well, I think it still runs actually, but, um, I found that I was not using it to its full capability. Sure. And actually, I think for most of my purposes of what I want to modify in a photo, the stuff in photos isn't, uh, you know, I mean, it has the basic, it has basic adjustments. It's not sophisticated. It's not sophisticated enough, you know, like layers and stuff like that. That's that that's for the pros. And that's where you want to, we want to move beyond photos. Well, you know, retouching, white balance, setting the levels. Um, I find that almost always does it for me. But there are a few other options. Yep, I like. Uh, oh, go ahead. I thought I, I mentioned thought. in the I mentioned in the last uh, the last episode that I still uh, I use Graphic Converter. Graphic Converter has, uh, in addition to doing conversions, uh, will let you fine tune many aspects of your image. So, and that you know, the program has been around forever. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think it's a good one. And if you want to delve into the open source arena, then you may want to bring out the GIMP. <laughs> so GIMP is GNU Image Manipulation Program, and uh, that's also been around forever. It's, yeah, that's uh, essentially a. I mean, it was to call it a Photoshop clone is the wrong term, but but the, it's it's. Its stated purpose, its mission in life was to create an open source alternative or replacement for Photoshop, I think is, is that's how I yeah, understood and I it. I remember at one point 
uh, what did they call it? But but it had it had a lot of the same tools that Photoshop had. Like one I remember was like a smart lasso. If you want to, yep. You know, surround a complex object, it would it would do that almost as well as uh, as Photoshop. Huh. So, uh, interesting. Interesting. Cool. Uh, I've got a couple others to throw in. Acorn is sort of the the one that comes out of people's mouths. Uh, you know, as, as the, if you're not going to say pixel mater, you say acorn, or if you're not going to say acorn, you say pixel mater. And, and that's, uh, from Gus Mueller at flying com. but you can download a, a 14 day trial right from there. And then acorn is also 29 99, just like pixel mater and does a, a lot of the same things. It's a slightly different UI, but way easier to use than Photoshop and really, really well done. Uh, so it's, you know, Another brilliant alternative and I think would run just fine on an older Mac. And then in the uh, in the chat room, Brian Monroe uh, suggests affinity photos uh, for as a good editor. And that keeps coming up on the show. I've never really messed around with affinity, but uh, but it, it keeps coming up. So I'm I'm curious about this. And I think it's. 40 yeah, 49.99 so a little more expensive than the other two might do a little bit more i don't know so um so for lightweight photo editors there you go that's that's some some good ones i like uh i like that we have so many options it, it you know and and especially i mean you said graphic converter has been around forever and it certainly has but you know even sort of the what i consider the newer ones like pixelmator and acorn um have been around for quite a while and 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 there's clearly you know desire in this market, which means that these apps are supported and the developers are making money, and so these apps will continue to 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 you know thrive. And I think that's great. So there you go, Coolio. All right, good way to get started with photos here, John. Uh, bringing us on to listener John would be our next thing here, and listener John. It says, my wife has her own iCloud account and has her photos being stored there from her phone. I want to get these photos and download them to my photos app on my Mac, not in the same account. First of all, I have found out that you can't do a bulk download from iCloud to a folder. But even worse, when you do a download, uh, the metadata regarding location data is stripped out. You know, we've talked about that. Is there a way to download these photos, hopefully in bulk, but more importantly, a download with the location metadata? So there are a couple different ways to approach this, and none of them are perfect. Um, one would be to create a separate user on your Mac and have that log into her iCloud account. And then, of course, it would sync down all of her photos. Then under your user account, you would use something like Power Photos to merge that photos library with your own. Uh, there would be some permissions hiccups to work through uh, because of the multiple users and stuff, but it's it's certainly doable. Um Another way to do it is you could have her phone also set to sync with Google Photos, and then Google Photos actually would allow you to share with a family, so you could then sync with Google. And Google's Photos family syncing is actually awesome. Uh, Amazon, if you're an Amazon Prime member, their Amazon Photos app also kind of does the same thing. Very, very cool in the way you can sort of choose how to share and automatically share or not automatically share is pretty good. Uh, and then from Google Photos, you could have it add to your camera roll. And then that would sync to your Mac. And then there you're in your iCloud library, too. Or you could do that. Uh, go back a couple of episodes. There's that whole thing that that guy was doing with Dropbox and uh, and and Hazel and auto syncing photos as they sort of auto export auto added to the library. That was, he was using Hazel to watch a folder inside in this case it would be inside of your the iPhone the photos library on your wife's Mac and have it copy those to a folder that you shared with Dropbox together and then it would beam those over and then you could use Hazel on your Mac to slurp those photos into your photos library and there you go but I don't know if that would get your metadata that would be something to check but there's lots of different ways to do it none of them perfect thank you apple but doable thoughts on that john this seems this is the holy grail for sure these days so yes. um so in that same vein so you can 
sync your photos from your iOS device to, as was mentioned, Dropbox, but I also use um, OneDrive. Mm -hmm. So considering the various uh, cloud services yeah. and seeing if they offer a photo sync, you know, you, you would then share. Um, that's one. Another, yeah, there's a few different ones here. So you can also, if, if you're within photos on your iOS device and you highlight a bunch of photos, there's that little icon on the lower left to share. You may just want to check some of those options. Well, you could may, you could certainly create a shared iCloud library or shared, yeah, iCloud album uh, that the two of you share. But it's it, the process of putting things in there is manual. Yeah. 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 Another thought would be one of those, um, one of these uh, uh, USB lightning kind of bridge devices here. The one that comes to mind to me is uh, the uh, iExpand uh -huh. sand disk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some of those have enough space where you probably should be able to copy all your photos over. And as mentioned, they have a lightning connector on one side and a USB on the other. So that may be a way to shuttle them about. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and those could those kinds of things can automatically, you know, grab new photos. That's true. Huh. That's I hadn't thought about that. That's an interesting. I like that angle, huh? Cool. Yeah. No, those are great products because, uh, yeah, as, as you pointed out, your your options are somewhat limited. Well, you just I mean, in um, terms of Apple helping you, they're limited. But yeah, yeah, yeah. The one thing that uh, well, I actually got excited about because I saw this option um, on my uh, on photos running on my Mac. Yep. Is that one of the share options? Is um um. Uh, the, the, the air uh, airdrop the air yeah airdrop yeah but it's not an op it's, oddly enough it's not an op i don't seem to see it as a sharing option on um on ios which is really? weird wait let me look yeah I mean, it would take a good long time yeah i mean you'd, you'd highlight all your photos and then then airdrop them over oh no no i'm sorry it says it right okay i'm sorry right below yeah i was gonna say the photos right i highlighted there. It yeah. says tap to share with AirDrop. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. May, again, it may take a while depending right. on how large right. your library is, but that would be a device to device uh, sharing. And yeah. Then, um, yeah. I wish Apple would, would solve this problem. It's, um, but they haven't. So here's, here's the options. All right. Uh, going on to James, sort of uh, taking a little bit of a detour from that. Now that we've sort of set the foundation here, he says, I have dozens of cookbooks, most of which I've not thoroughly perused, which makes me feel wasteful. I've been trying to OCR the indexes of all these cookbooks, not their entire contents. So that when I'm planning meals for the week, I can easily see how many different versions of a given recipe or preparations of a particular ingredient I have access to, but it is proving difficult. The methods, two methods I've tried are using a flatbed scanner, scanning the indexes, either using image capture or, you know, the scanner software and then generating PDFs of the scans and then using EXIF tool to edit the author metadata so that ScanSnap will OCR the document. So that's one. And then two, using a digital camera, set up a camera on a tripod, set the cookbook frame in the focus, take the picture, generate a PDF of the images, yada, yada, yada. Um, so those are definitely two options and let you do all of the steps manually. And sometimes that's cool, but other times that's not cool. And for that, I really think your iPhone might be the magic answer here. I use a, P I use a piece of software called PDF Scan Plus from Smile, right? Same people that make PDF Pen Pro and, and Text Expander and all that. And uh, I use it on my iPhone all the time to make... PDFs on my phone of music scores and I can scan a hundred page music score in about five minutes with this thing. And it's great. And I do it. You can choose to do color grayscale or black and white right in the moment of, of scanning it. So you don't even have to like go back and, and like reduce it later. I choose black and white. So I get the high contrast thing. That sounds like what you would want for your cookbooks too, just especially with the indexes. Uh, do that. It saves it as a PDF on your phone. You can OCR it right there and boom, you're done. And I think PDF scan plus is like, I don't know, it's less than 10 bucks. I think it's, I think it's a lot less than 10 bucks. So that's my answer to that 
is, uh, and there are other apps too. That's, that's the one I use, but, but there are other apps that, you know, sort of do similar things. So that's my, that's my advice. Any thoughts, John? Um, I concur with the scan snap angle. I kind of like that. So I have one of the, they provided me with uh, one a number of years ago and it still works pretty well. It's their IX 100. It's like a bar. Oops. <laughs> um, but but he doesn't profile. have, he doesn't have a scan snap scanner, I think is the right, issue. Right. right. But I, I actually agree with you. The scan snap thing would be, well, I don't know if it would be as easy because if his cookbooks are bound, then uh, right, right. you've got to do it with flatbed. Yeah. So I don't know that a, a scan snap would be the answer. This is why I like the iPhone option. Cause it's the same thing, right? My music scores are bound too. And it just flip pages and I'm done. It's really easy. And I'm trying to remember, you know, I, I seem to recall there being an image scanner that would scan books specifically. I think it was just basically a flatbed scanner or something. Yeah. Or digital camera. Because, yeah, I mean, you get, as you pointed out, yeah, you don't want to rip the pages out of it. Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, exactly. Out of it. And uh, books don't feed too well through uh, image scanners. Right, right, right. All right. I would have sworn that I put this one in here, John, when we moved everything around. Oh, I did. Oh, right. Now I remember. Okay. Uh, so jumping to Canon in a similar vein, but I'm not sure we have the answer here, sort of combining the last two questions. Ken uh, says, I remember a long time ago, you mentioned there was a Mac app that could scan words from a picture. Yep. And that's PDF pen could do that. Uh, I won't go into details, but I have a lot of trouble reading. So I use my iMac to speak the text to me. Some sites or uh, Mac apps don't allow me to select the words because there is not text, just an image. Do you know of an app that could help me scan the words on a site or on an app so I can select the words so my Mac can speak them to me? So I think we're, I'm going to, I, I, we had this come in a month or so ago and I've still not come up with an answer. So I'm throwing this out as a geek challenge. You know, essentially we want on the fly OCR, optical character recognition, on the fly OCR of a picture. And off the top of my head, I don't know of anything to do that, but I like the idea. And it seems like, Ken, you wouldn't be the only one that mm -hmm. would want to take advantage of this. So if anybody knows, feedback at MacGeekCab.com is the way to get in touch with us. You said it, brother. Feedback at MacGeekCab.com. Well, I said feedback at MacGeekCab.com. So, you know, it, whatever, either one. It's fine. They, they, they all work. All right. Uh, one last one here in the photos realm, John. This one from Daniel. And Daniel asks, uh, he says, I'm getting caught that every time I launch photos, I get this intro screen that says, what's new in photos? And offers to give me a tour and then says, get started. So, so I thought maybe it was a permissions issue on the app on my Mac. But when I do a get info on photos, I see that the system has read and write. Wheel has read only. Everyone has read only. And then also everyone has custom privileges, which is interesting. Mm. Yes. Uh, that ain't right. That ain't right. I don't think that's right. So I'm looking at this on my Mac and I have actually exactly the same thing, John. Really? Hold yeah. On. What do you have? Doesn't seem yep. right. Okay. Everyone custom, system, read and write, wheel, read only, everyone read only. Cool. Huh. Great. So he says, um, and he tried adding himself as a, a, you know, permissions there, and it didn't seem to change anything. Uh, I don't think, so here's, here, I have a thought. And my thought is, if you create or use, and if you don't have one, create one now so that you have one when you need it. Create a test user account that's an admin user. Don't forget the password. That's the, the trick because you're not going to use this often because you're going to leave this account as pristine as possible, not going to install stuff into it. But log into that account. Now, the first time you open photos, it is going to tell you what's new in photos. Great. Let it do that. Maybe even add a photo in just to like add something to your library. Quit it. Relaunch it. See if it still happens. My guess is that it will not. Um, my guess is that this is something in your user account, not application specific. And so by digging into your, you know, by using this test account, you can, you can definitively answer that question. 
And then once you know the answer, then you can start looking in places like, uh, you know, home library preferences uh, for, you know, photos preferences. And maybe there's something corrupt out there that is um, that is causing the issue. And, and the way I would test for that is go and look for. So if we look in home library, where's my library folder preferences, not preference panes. And then uh, I always sort this alphabetically and I look, I would look for com.apple.photos something. And so I'm looking there and I see a com.apple.photos.plist with photos not launched. I would move this out of the way, like just put it on my desktop, then relaunch photos, see what happens, um, you know, and then quit relaunch again and see if you get that message. This would be the way to, to troubleshoot that at least one way. What do you think, John? Could be a launch services issue. It could. That's for sure. Yep. Yeah. And how do you fix that? I'll tell you how you fix that. One way you can do that is you can fix it with Onyx. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm man. Look oh, here. Good call. Under... Yeah. Some of the. Okay. So it's um, so Onyx maintenance rebuilding. And there's a checkbox next to something called launch services. And that's a database. That one thing I believe that database does is the first time you launch an app, it'll warn you that you're doing that. Right. But um, I'm wondering if it's also responsible for it thinking that it's being launched for the first time every time. That could be. That yeah. could be. I like it. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Cool. All right, man. Anything else on photos before we uh, move on to our next deep dive, John? No, it pretty much does what I need. I'm I'm really happy I moved over to uh, yeah, you know, iCloud Photo Library. I didn't think I needed it. I mean, you know, I went kicking and screaming, paying a couple extra bucks. To, same. Uh, <laughs> I, I did the same thing. My, yeah, my, I was like, I don't need this. I have, and we'll talk about it in a minute. But you know, I've got, you know, at the time it was Photo Station. Now it's Moments on my Synology, or I've got Google Photos, or I'm an Amazon Prime member. Like I, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And then as soon as I moved over to iCloud Photo Library, I realized I was, I was wrong. Um, I, you know, the, there, are, there are huge convenience benefits to iCloud Photo Library, for sure. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. All right. I want to talk about our two sponsors, and I'm going to start with Ring. Ring is, man, like, ever since I started using Ring... I've become a huge fan. So Ring's mission is to make neighborhoods safer. And they say they've got over a million people using their video doorbell to protect their homes. But it's more than that. Although John and I both have the Ring video doorbell and it's awesome because, you know, as I said, like the, the just like a couple of weeks ago, we had our um, we had the the electrician here actually it was the electric company here to replace a pole and they rang the bell and woke us up they were here first thing in the morning and i didn't have to race out of bed i just grabbed my phone and said hey and i could see who it was on my phone and i can talk two ways to him it was like this is great here you go i'll be down in in like two minutes the guy's like yeah no problem i know we're here early i'm like great thanks man you know so i threw on clothes and i went down uh but it's more than that, right? Because I could also look in the driveway because we have the ring floodlight looking at the driveway and I could see that it was the, you know, a power company's truck was there. And then I've also got a ring floodlight on the back porch so I can see what's going on back there. And it records it for me so I can check it after the fact. I, it, I can answer the door. Like I happen to be home. I was asleep, but I happen to be home when that happened. I can answer my door from anywhere I am, even even from on vacation, because it rings on our phones. It rings on every member of the family's phones. It, it, it wasn't a trick to set up. It's just how it works. Setup is super easy. You got to check this out. And here's the thing. I've got a deal. You can save up to 150 bucks off of a ring of security kit. You can you know have doorbells and floodlight cams and all those things in it. So you can save 150 bucks off a ring of security kit when you go to ring.com slash M G G go to ring.com slash M G G one more time. 
for good measure, ring.com slash MGG, R-I-N-G dot C-O-M slash MGG. That is the only URL that will let you see these savings. Otherwise, you're going to pay a lot more. So go check it out. Have fun with it. Our thanks to Ring for sponsoring this episode. Also, our thanks to the folks at Bare Bones, BB Edit, for sponsoring this episode. Man, this is a piece of software. It is running right here, right now. It's the thing I use to manipulate and manage the chapters and show notes that we have. Uh, it like without BB Edit, I'm not sure what I would do. And I don't, I mean, I, I do actually quite a bit of coding and stuff. And I use BB Edit for that too, because it's great. Like if I need to edit uh, files that are part of our Git repositories, it knows how to deal with that locally. If I need to edit files that are direct on the server, uh, it knows how to do that. Even though Adam yells at me that I'm not supposed to be editing things live on the server, especially not code, but I do it anyway. And BB Edit makes it super easy for me to do that. And usually I don't make mistakes. And so that's good. But if I do, BB Edit has multiple, like almost unlimited, I, I think there are, they are unlimited levels of undo. So if I hit save, which is all I have to do to save to the FTP server, I hit save and, uh, and then realize, hey, look, I broke Mac Observer. Awesome. I just do a bunch of undos and then I hit save again. And look, I fixed Mac Observer. Woo, I'm the savior. Uh, so BB Edit makes it super easy to do that. Plus you can do things just like counting words and, and finding differences in text. And you can even invoke BB Edit from the command line just by, well, you have to install their command line tools, but that comes with BB Edit. And then you just do BB Edit space file name. Good to go. Check it out. Go to barebones.com. Download your free trial of BB Edit. And in fact, you can do all of the things I just talked about with the free version of BB Edit. You don't even need to buy it, but I'm sure you'll want to anyway. Check it out, barebones.com. All right, John. Let's move on to our Synology section. Sound good to you? Absolutely. Cool. All right. I figured the way to start was with Olga. Because this is a question I get all the time, man. And it is, it is this. She says, I'm thinking of upgrading my two base Synology play and would like to get your opinion as experienced Synology users, which Synology disk station should I buy? This is, of course, a loaded question. There are so many Synology disk stations and so many different ways of looking at how to get them that it gets a little crazy. So she tells us, she says, we'll use her as sort of a case study here. I am using a Synology as a secondary backup device and also for remote access of files, photos, and videos. I have one wireless cam camera connected to it. I travel often and I like to stream home videos and photos using Synology software. I would also like to use a VPN. The primary reason I'm upgrading is that my disk station is slow. Streaming video is a pain. Photos load slowly. Do I really need to upgrade or is there something I can do to make mine work faster? If I decide to upgrade to a four bay, would I really need the play models with hardware transcoding? And so what is the best model for my needs? So the way I look at this is you got to pick sort of the features that you need and then narrow it down. And uh, I think for most people, you most of us are going to wind up using this for um, hardware for, you know, in part anyway, for streaming videos. Right. And with that in mind, Synology has some of their disk stations, the play models, but not always. They, they don't always have the play moniker, but that have a hardware transcoding chip in them in addition to just the CPU so that you're not just using the CPU to do the transcoding of your videos. You, you've actually got a hardware chip in there that's dedicated and can just do it while keeping your CPU free to do other things. So that's one thing that you would want to do. Uh, and you want to think about that, right? If you want to have a VPN server, a lot of us probably want to do that. You want to think about that. You want to think about how big you want this to be in terms of how many drives do you want to put in there? Um, you know, drives, you can get drives that are 12 terabytes now. So um, know that in order to have fault tolerance, which means if one drive dies, you still have another and your data isn't lost. One of your drives, and this is, there's an asterisk here because the formulas don't always work this way, but essentially 
one of your drives will always be dedicated to fault tolerance. So if you buy if you buy a two base Synology and you have two 12 terabyte drives, you have 12 terabytes of usable storage. If you buy a four base Synology and put in three 12 terabyte drives using the same formula, and this is true, you will have 24 terabytes of usable storage. Right, so you're only giving up one drive. So you're giving up percentage-wise more in a two-bay unit than in a three, four, five, eight, more, more. So that's where I always start with this, and I do tend to focus on the um, on the you know the hardware transcoding is sort of the first thing that I go with. Thankfully, Synology has a place that you can go and compare different NAS devices. Um, and that's really where uh, I find it super easy because you can just go to the page and select what you want and start comparing different items. And life starts getting a little bit easier when you do that, I think. But any, um, any thoughts on this, John, before I start giving uh, specific recommendations for Olga here? Um, that's actually where I was going to go is that okay. they have, uh, most NAS vendors have some sort of selector where you, uh, <clears throat> you identify what you want to use it for and, right. um, and they try to steer you in the right direction. Yep. Um, yeah, I guess the, the, the one thing I do like is this, some of them. So, uh, you know, think about the future when you get a Synology, the nice thing, for example, the one that I have. Um, several of them support an expansion chassis. Hmm. And th you'll know that because the model will have a plus at the end of it. So, for example, I have the DS713 plus. Um, oh. that, means, uh, that means you can add a expansion bay. And uh, so, for example, that's a two bay unit, but, you, but I also have a two bay expansion chassis. So I can put up to four drives in there. So I'm... Well, I kind of have three and a half. I'll, I'll maybe describe <laughs> what's happening with that. Yeah. Um, well, I'll tell you now. Uh, another thing you may want to consider is that um, you may want to set up one of the drives as a SSD cache. And that's actually what I have. So I have three drives and one of the drive base has an SSD in it. And that's nice because it speeds things up. Yep. So consider that too when you're getting one is that you, you, can, get a, you, you can give it a little oomph. Uh, by do it by setting aside one drive bay for an SSD cache, huh? Right. Yeah, another yeah, thing I'm yeah, thinking, if sure. we, if yeah. And then the other thing I'm thinking, if we're talking speed, is that I think almost all of them support um, uh, uh, link aggregation, and that you can. Why do I keep knocking this thing over? <laughs> I'm gonna put it over there. I got this thing here. I keep knocking over. Okay. That's done. Um, but yeah, the, uh, a lot of them now. Well, some of the newer ones. Um, I believe now have a, like most vendors uh, offer a 10 gig port instead of a gig port. Um, but also several of the models, uh, even, even this relatively low end one that I have here, or old one, because it's, you know, 13 made in 2013, but you can bond two of the, uh, two of the ethernet ports together to also get a little, uh, little extra. Oomph. Yeah. I would say for most people, for most of us, even John and I in our homes and, and to be fair, I do run this link aggregation thing. I, I would not even spend a moment's thought thinking about that when choosing your Synology. You're, oh. Well, I mean, most of the time, you know, even streaming video, even if you have 10 people in your house streaming video, you're never going to mm -hmm. use up your gigabit pipe. And in your house, the fastest pipe you most likely have is a gigabit pipe, and that's your Ethernet. You really, you're talking about Wi-Fi. So right. your bottleneck is not the speed to and from your disk station, right? It's cool to be able to like have two disk stations talk to each other faster than that. If you're backing up from them, we'll talk about that in a minute. But beyond <laughs> that, I wouldn't like, it's not even worth wasting an ethernet port on it. To be perfectly honest, you're just not going to see the benefit, but the rest of the stuff for sure. Um, and I would go, you know, for Olga, Yes, your speed problems are the CPU in that unit. Um, I have a very similar unit here. I've got a couple of uh, disk stations, and I've got a similar unit here, and it's just always slow. Even just launching disk station manager, it just comes up much slower than any of the others. And and it and it's because those were built to be, you know, sort of entry 
level budget items to get you in and 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 see if it's the right thing for you without spending a ton of money and you've you've seen that it is you've gotten good use out of it and now it's time to upgrade so i would go with either the ds418 play or the ds918 plus um, the, and they're both, you know, 2018 models. That's where the 18 comes from. Uh, even though the DS918 plus doesn't have play in its name, it does have the hardware transcoding engine, which makes me salivate over this one a little bit. I, the, the one I have, I've got a DS, um, 1817 plus, which does not have the hardware transcoding engine. So I'm stuck with the, the CPU. Now it's a quad core CPU and it, it does okay. But, um, but, you know, it, it would do better if it had the hardware transcoding engine. So the 918 Plus has that. Um, the RAM makes a huge difference on Synologies, and the 918 comes with four gigs of RAM, but both of these are expandable. The, the 418 Play comes up comes with two. And I will put a link to compare these two in the show notes so you can easily, easily see them. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I the... The um, the 918 Plus is a nice looking unit there. It's got the Plus. So as you just informed me, I had no idea that's what the Plus meant, but it's expandable, which is cool. Both of these do link aggregation um, and and they will serve you quite well, uh, I think. So I would I always it, like the moment I get a Synology, I expand the RAM to the maximum that it can take because I've found it makes such a huge difference, both in the responsiveness of it. But also in the, the just the transfer speeds, it it definitely makes good use of all that RAM. And to rewind back to episode seven seventeen, their hardware transcoding engine, John, it supports H.265. The Apple, hey, yeah, the high believe. efficiency video core. Yeah, I know. It's pretty good. So Yeah. I don't and just I you know, I didn't know this for the longest time until I went to one of their events and I'm like, what do all the numbers mean? Yeah. And right. Just to get it out of our system here. Yeah. So DS means disk station. I right. think you have some others now. Yeah, RT um, the for first router. number yep. is the number of bays. And then the last two numbers are the year that it was released. And then the plus is means that you can expand it to that number. So for example, mine is a 713. It's two bays, but I can add a five bay, which adds up to seven. So that's that's how you decipher that. So why does the 1817 plus have a one? Uh, after DS, do you know that answer? Oh no, 1817. Yeah. It's an eight bay unit. And the 1517 is a five bay unit. Well, it must be able to go up to that. Number. I think it can, it can scale up. I think that's the answer. That's right. Yeah. 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 But the DS 1817, I don't think the plus means expandable, John, because I'm comparing the DS 1817 to the DS 1817 plus, And the difference is, a 1.7 gigahertz CPU versus a 2.4 gig gigahertz CPU and the ability to support an M.2 SATA SSD cache instead of de dedicating a drive bay to it. So um, I, I don't think the plus means what we think it means. No, I think it does. I mean, I'm looking well, at the description of the product right in front of me and it says DS1817 plus and one of the bullets says scales up to 18 drives. Correct. So. And the DS1817 also has that bullet without the plus. No, that's so, what I thought it meant. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Uh, it's crazy, man. Uh, it's crazy. But that so th this is this is why it's so common to get the question, what's the right disk station? And you can always email us and we're happy to kind of guide you on the on this. But you know, it's it's actually a question we get a lot. Um, but uh you know, going and and just sort of narrowing down, you know, how many drive bays you want. And looking at the CPU and looking at the hardware video transcoding engine, that that's sort of the the three big ones to start with, and and it and it focuses down from there. So um, that's that's the uh, that that's how I always start, and that has not served me nor anyone that I've advised wrong thus far. It's just like figure out what you need, and and you know, and go from there. So, but that nine eighteen plus, that's a that's a that's a really attractive one these days. I, you know, we and we will spend more time talking about Synology. They are they're they are not the only NAS vendor out there 
there really are two other big ones. Drobo uh, that makes their uh, N series NAS, right? That, uh, that are network capable or N, N series units that are network capable. All NASs are network capable. NAS, it means network attached storage. Uh, so, so there's Drobo out there and then there's QNAP. Uh, QNAP and Synology, they must have like shared some foundation together because their software is very similar. The names of their packages are all very similar. Um, and, and the way things work is, is a little more, um, it, it's very, it's a, it's a very similar experience, especially when you compare to Drobo, which is like not web-based it's, you know, you have to run an app and the, 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 the big benefit, uh, and really kind of the big holdback for me to, to Drobo is the third party app support for it is very, very minimal, um, it's getting better though. Like they've got the right leadership in place now. So I, th I think, I think we'll see good things out of them, but for Synology and QNAP, there's, you know, the support's huge and, and very, um, there's a, there's a long history of it too. But, um, the big thing for me is that QNAP really seems more focused on the enterprise. Synology certainly is focused on the enterprise, but also oh, is yeah. very focused on the home. Um, and, and, and so I've always liked, Synology a little better for the home than QNAP, although, you know, there are there are some benefits like their transcoding engine and their CPUs and the QNAP stuff blows away some of the Synology. So it is worth looking at like something like the the QNAP, you know, the TS451 plus is uh, it's a four bay unit and really um, it's quite a it's quite a beast in terms of kind of the way it all works together. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes, too. I think. Yeah. yeah. I think our only minor, we haven't paid as much attention to QNAP as, as we probably should because they don't really do anything beyond standard RAID last I checked, which. That's correct. Yep. And that, and it's frustrating. Yeah. So by that, what John means is, you know, in my example before I said, we got three 12 terabyte drives in this four bay unit. Well, that's great. A, if you can afford 12 terabyte drives and B, if you're buying all your drives at once. But if you're not buying all your drives at once, then uh, what you have is a scenario where you might have drives of different sizes in the same unit. QNAP will only see drives that are the same size. And if you set, let's say you have a bunch of three terabyte drives and then you add a five terabyte drive, it will only see three terabytes on that drive until all of your drives are five terabyte drives. Whereas Synology, as soon as it can, it will start seeing more of that space on your other drives as you expand and put things in. So you can have, you can have and use mixed size drives in Synology. You cannot in QNAP. You also can have mixed size drives in Drobo too, just to make that clear. So that's a uh, right, right. Mm -hmm. We're good on that. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see. So where are we here? Let's, oh yeah, Lewis. Great. So Lewis kind of has the follow-up question to, uh, to Olga's, which Synology should I get? He says, uh, I'm trying to stream. Actually, it's Louie. Sorry, Lou. Sorry, Louie. Uh, I'm trying to streamline and simplify my tech life by evaluating if I really need all the hardware and services that I own and manage. I already own a Synology NAS for uh, quite a while now, and I'm debating buying a new one to replace it, uh, to replace several services I use. He says Dropbox uh, is one. He says, I understand you might uh, lose some of the sharing functionality uh, in terms of how easy it is to share, but I get all of the private cloud stuff with, with the Synology. And number two, he says Backblaze does not back up my network drives. So how are you backing up Synology files? Uh, really what he's asking is what are all the things that I can do with my Synology um, once I get it, which is a great question. And so he started with, um, you know, private cloud, we'll call it file syncing, right? Dropbox and private Dropbox is really the right way to, to kind of conceive of it. Since I think we all understand what Dropbox is. And if we don't, it's a way of, syncing folders between your multiple devices. But when you do that with Dropbox, or like you said, when we we're in the photo section, you know, one, one drive or box.com, 
you're syncing with someone else's server with Synology. Uh, they called it cloud station and now they're calling it Synology drive, but it's essentially the same thing. You are syncing with your own server. And the nice part about that is you don't pay anybody a monthly fee for extra storage and no one else has access to your data. And I use Synology Drive. I've used CloudStation for a long time. And then when it switched over to Synology Drive, I made that switch with it. And it's fantastic. I don't worry or think about how much space I'm taking up. I don't worry who has access to my data. And I can sync when I'm local. I can sync when I'm remote. And it just works. Uh, I love it. Do you use uh, Synology Drive, John? No, but I do use their... Um, uh, Cloud Station server. So that's it. So cloud, that, sta yeah. cloud Station backup. Oh, that's different. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. So that that's their that's their their own backup engine. That's right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Which you can also do, right? And so you run instead of running or in addition, I think, but to running Time Cap Time Machine on your Mac, you run Cloud Station backup the app Correct. on your Mac, and that backs up your Mac to your your Synology. Is that right? I back up a subset okay so i use that to back up my documents Got and i it. use time machine to back up the entire drive mm. just for space reasons yeah of course of course wow very cool okay and that works well their mac app for that feels like a first class citizen on your mac and all that stuff right uh, i mean there's not much to it i mean it basically yeah. just you know you either get a, a file browser if you want to restore stuff or um yep. Or it just tells you what the uh, the latest thing that it it uh, synced. So, okay, cool. Yeah, there's really not much to it. I mean, I see its icon in the uh, in the menu bar, but Good. Uh, I'm never terribly interested in what it's doing because anytime I look at you know. It'll show you. It says you know last updated, and it's yeah. typically you know minutes ago. Well, that's good. Well, that's good. Cool. So that's you know th those that's sort of the first big thing. Um, Videos, I, either using their own video station app suite of apps, I should say, which includes apps for your, your iOS devices and all that, where you can store videos on your Synology and then sync them down to your devices or stream them to your Apple TV or to your Macs or to your iPhone or your iPad. Um, that's, you know, a very popular use of your your network storage devi device. You can do it, like I said, with their video station suite of devices, but you can also do it with Plex. Uh, and and I run both on mine because I can have them both point at exactly the same video library. So there's no, uh, is no real overlap or anything. It's not like I have to store two copies of my library. By and large, we all use Plex in the house because we're just used to it. But um but, you know, Video Station works. You can sync stuff for offline viewing, and it's very, very simple and all of that stuff. So, but Plex will run, and Plex will take advantage of the Synology hardware transcoders, and, and it, they have a very tight relationship there. So, it like, that works really, really well. Um, I, and I love it. Uh, it's great. In addition yeah. to... Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, one thing that, that I also use, so they also have a, a thing called Media Server, which mm -hmm. I think is pretty similar. But what I use it for, uh, I kind of, so I use it to share my music using a protocol called DLNA. And the thing is, I happen to have a speaker in the house that understands ah. music that's published in D, uh, DLNA. Perfect. Uh, the HEOS, actually. So the Denon HEOS uh, will see a DLNA source. So, so that's one way that I uh, can listen to my music. Interesting. Plex, of cool. course. Cool. Um, all right. Uh, so that um, I'm trying to, th to see where we are here. Oh, y you know, we um, so we've talked about some of the uses for home. Oh, another big one is VPN, right? You can set up a VPN server on your disk station and and use that as a vpn server when you're out and about to get access not only to your disk station but anything on your home network and you can configure that and control it and again the nice part is it is your server you are connecting to your network so you're not paying a monthly fee and all of that stuff and it supports 
uh, you know, various types of VPNs that, that you can use on your iPhone uh, and, and your Macs. And it works very, very well. Uh, very reliable. Uh, we use, well, we use Synology's VPN on their router now, but, uh, but for a long time we used it on their, on their um, disk station. I think you use yours on the disk station, right, John? Mm -hmm. Yep. And, um, you know, it, like it, there's surveillance station, which Olga alluded to, because you can have your Wi-Fi cameras linked up to this and surveillance station is pretty cool. It allows you to kind of take all kinds of different webcams. They need to be open source or openly addressable webcams. Um, so a lot of the, you know, specific ones, like you can't link your ring stuff with it and, and you can't link your link, your drop cam with it. I don't think, right. Can you link, no. you can't link your drop cam with it. Yeah. Okay. But you can buy like, you know, like there's the, this Foscam camera that I, I have that I use with it, that I have aimed at uh, Hector's cage and it's, it like, it has a motor in it and I can control it and, you know, move it up and down and swivel side to side and all that stuff. And it works great. That's like an $80 camera or something. And you can create your own, you know, they call it surveillance station, but you can use it, you know, to monitor security or whatever you want to do. And again, the nice part is you're not streaming that data to some cloud service. You're storing it on your own. So that whole privacy thing comes right back up. And then, and then there's the stuff for offices and for business. Um, I think we've all used, you know, Google Docs uh, on the web or iCloud, you know, you've got pages and numbers and stuff that you can do on the web. Well, Synology has Synology Office, and it's like your own privately hosted Google Docs. Uh, the web interface is stellar. It doesn't feel really any like it doesn't feel like you're missing anything that Google Docs has. We use it for a couple of the businesses here and it's awesome. Like we just don't even think about it anymore. In fact, one of the guys was like, wait, you, you're hosting this in your office? I said, yeah. He's like, holy crap. On what? And I said, well, just my little disk station. It's like, that's amazing. And it is amazing. It's, it's really, really well done and, and pretty lightweight. Like I don't see a lot of. CPU load on it from my, you know, stuff. There's only a few of us using it at any point in time, but we've got some documents we're updating constantly and it just, you know, works great. And everybody sees the updates cause it's all right there in our web browsers and, and all that stuff. So, so that works well. They've got a thing called note station and then apps for the Mac and your iOS devices. It's like an Evernote clone. And John this morning when Evernote wouldn't let us sync notes between us and actually Evernote's telling me it's not syncing notes between us now. I'm thinking maybe we should move over to note station, man. It's ironic that I'm reading this note out of Evernote, but there you go. Um, and they've got a chat thing. That's kind of like Slack. Uh, that again, you just host on your own. So you're not worrying about storage space and, and paying monthly fees. Uh, and then, you know, you can do other things on it. Well, they have Synology Moments, which is it automatically, you can put an app on your phone to sync all your photos to it. And then it indexes your photos automatically, categorizes them, date, time, location, and faces. And yeah, it does facial recognition. And instead of Apple's crazy thing where it makes your Mac and your iPhone and your iPad all do separate facial recognition on device, well, Synology does it on the server where it's supposed to be done and you still have the same privacy because it's all your data. So it's pretty cool. Um, and then, you know, there's like, you can use it for, for bit torrenting stuff. There's a lot of people that, that, you know, use like transmission or Synology's download station to download torrents. And for those of you that are downloading torrents that maybe you don't want to have to have a conversation with your ISP about, you can actually set up your Synology to, um, connect to a VPN server on its outbound connections. So all of that stuff is private and all of that. You'd have to get a third party VPN server, obviously for that. But uh, yeah, those are the, the, so there you go. If that didn't whet your appetite, then uh, a NAS probably isn't for you. I would think. And all of these same things are doable on the, on the QNAPs. Um, most of them, some of them I'll say are doable on the Drobo. Uh, a lot of the office related stuff is not, I don't think it'll do a VPN server. I don't think it'll do VPN outbound. Um, and I don't think it'll do the photo stuff in that way, but it will do Plex. So there's that. I don't think it does uh, 
personal cloud either. So, so there you can see some of the limitations of, of why we, this is why we keep coming back to Synology, right? Drobo has the, the right infrastructure, but, but not all the apps. QNAP has all the apps, but you have to use drives of the same size. Synology is the best of both worlds. So that's why we keep coming back to that. Right? Good? Yeah. I think so. I think it's great. I think it's fun, too. I like this. I mean, the only thing I will say about Synology is that sometimes accomplishing certain tasks, I mean, they keep getting better. So right now, I believe the latest version of their software, which they call DSM, yep. is at 6.2, yep. and they keep improving it. But accomplishing some things, you may have to do it in, in a roundabout manner that's not necessarily straightforward. I'll give you that. Yeah, <clears throat> for sure. It does a lot more, but it's also more complex to negotiate certain things. Like, for example, setting setting up to do a time machine. Yep, you gotta be in. You gotta go to like two or three different places in order to get that to work the way that you want. It's totally true. I've always said there is no such thing as a novice NAS device. In that, you could be a novice, but when you buy a NAS, that's sort of the thing that makes you not a novice anymore. You I mean you're at some level you're going to be, you know, managing your network now in a in a more hands-on way uh for for your home. But but there's all these cool things that you can do. And it's not terribly difficult, right? I but I agree with what you're saying, John, that that it's just it's like any well, it's like anything that you have to learn how the user interface works. And Synology's is not quite as intuitive as say the mac is but it's not yeah. terrible either it it's it's not terrible yeah yeah and, and a few others to mention so um and i consider these guys nas vendors but um okay. wd makes some uh multi-drive units that will perform cloudy stuff and raid type stuff yes um, they, they are technically nas devices very feature feature set limited Right. Like they do. They are not built to be all purpose NAS devices. They are like, let's sync your photos and your videos and your files and nothing else. And that's yeah, fine. And it'll let yeah. you do a basic raid. It'll give you basic redundancy. Mm -hmm. A lot mm -hmm. of them. Um, mm -hmm. So I wouldn't I wouldn't count them out. It depends on what you need to do. The right. thing is that the Synology, I would say, almost does too much. Well, <laughs> it, it can be overwhelming. We've whereas been these using, other guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to say, we've been using Synologies here for, what, five years, and there are still things that it's like, oh, I had no idea I could do that. Like, oh, cool. Great. Fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. All right. Let's talk about backups. You kind of opened that door, John, and, uh, and so we will, we, will, we will kick it open. And Bruce, uh, Bruce will start us down this path, but we've got quite a few questions that will kind of... I think probably wrap up the episode with this, which is great. Uh, he says in previous episodes, you, I heard you mention having a drive array at pilot Pete's house as an offsite backup for your drive array and also the reverse setup for pilot Pete. Uh, I've been thinking about doing something similar with one of my sons in law. And I wondered how you did the network setup. Can you tell me how your networks are configured phys physical and IP at both ends to allow this to happen? I'm particularly curious about how the VPN or VPNs are set up. Yeah. So, right. If you have devices on either end and you want to back up to each other, you need to somehow tunnel those two devices together. And you could do that with a VPN, but thankfully we have not had to. Now, we've previously used CrashPlan as sort of the conduit to make that happen. But CrashPlan in, in that scenario is going away. You can't do peer-to-peer -peer CrashPlan anymore past like September or something. So we are using our disk stations to do it. And we are using a piece of software called Hyper Backup uh, to make this happen. And, and what's cool is many disk stations have USB ports on them that you can use to attach printers. You can connect it to your, your UPS so that it knows when the power's out, but you can also connect it to an external drive. So Pete's given me an external drive. I've given him an external drive that we've plugged into our respective disk stations. And then we use hyper backup on our disk stations 
to back up to each other. You actually use hyper backup as the client and hyper backup vault as the server. So we're each running both. Uh, you know, I connect to hyper backup vault on Pete's and I can save my data there. It's encrypted. It's my data. He can't read it, um, but it's there. And you and the nice part is, of course, I can start it locally here and seed the backup so that I'm doing not doing that across the Internet and then just. And then just do the offsite. So hyper backup is the key to backing up data from one disk station to another. Uh, and I do it with Pete, but I also do it locally. Like I said, I've got a couple of disk stations. And so with extra storage, I just have, you know, the things that I don't want to lose backed up. And that's why you back them up. But yeah, hyper backup works great for that. So have you done you? You have two disk stations, right, John? So you've played a little bit with hyper backup, I think you said. Yes. So what I do, redundancy is always good, right? Yeah. Redundancy is, <laughs> redundancy is always good. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, so on my 713, that is, well, I store data on there, but I also store my time machine backups. But then what I do is I set up a hyper backup task to take the entire contents of that one mm -hmm. and send it all to another one. Smart. So in case my primary NAS totally yeah. melts down i yeah. have a full backup on the other one and i've actually done this in the past like i've had a uh, time machine backups get corrupt well because i'm backing up my time machine file from one to the other um oh, i've restored i've had it where for whatever reason the file gets corrupt i'm like well let me get the one from a couple days ago and see if it's okay and actually the last time i tried that it, it in fact did not Solve the problem. It was it was in the uh, perpetual uh, preparing backup state. Yeah, uh, if you ever had that happen, where it just never gets out of that state because it's just so horribly confused about everything. Yeah, totally. Yep. Yep. So, um, it's worth mentioning though that Hyper Backup, which is their client, can back up not only, or I think we're going to be talking about this soon, but let's talk about it now because it's yeah. right in front yeah, of. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So one of your targets can be another Synology device. Right. which is what I just talked about. So, um, But two other destinations that you can set up with Hyper Backup is one could be a remote file server using something like rsync or webdav, but then also Hyper Backup will talk to multi many popular cloud services like Amazon, Google, Dropbox, Microsoft, S3, and a few others that I have never heard of. But, well, um, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to actually I'm going to talk about those other ones, because if you take a look at the list that's there, um, there are some that will offer you not insignificant amounts of storage for free. In fact, I use one called Hubic that I had never heard of before. H-U-B-I capital C. Oh, yeah. yeah yep. oh. And I'm backing up to Hubic every day. And I think they give me 25 gigs for free. So I've wow. got, yeah. So I've found like 20 gigs of data, like, you know, my, my top 20 essentially. And it's like, yep, off it goes and it works out great. And another one that's out there is Synology C2 backup. Um, and now that's available in the U S you can use it. Um, or it's available to users worldwide. I think their data center is in, I, I want to say it's in Germany, which is great because Germany has awesome privacy laws. But um, but yeah, you can use Synology C2 and back up to that, too. And I and in many ways, I think it's less expensive than a lot of the others. So uh, and C2, I mean, it's been working so well for me. It's just crazy. Uh, so I back up to that every day, too. So. Yeah, Hubic. So, yeah, hi hyper backup is is awesome for for all of those things like you said john yeah it's it's i mean it's it the name is appropriate because it just does everything um which i think is great so cool you got anything else john on this one not not for that so, okay um so yeah the one the, the one thing that i mentioned before is that so setting up time machine gets weird because you got to set up quotas for the user that you identify as the time machine user yeah, it it is. This that is, got kind of weird from I, my my perspectives, and and the, maybe I didn't do it, but but the way I did it is that so I create one user, or, so I created a user called uh, Mac Mini Backup, and then I created another user called MacBook Pro Backup. Yes, 
And then um, I set them up with a quota and you can do this under most operating systems. And so, you know, I, as a guideline, I think for most time machine, you want to allocate twice the amount of space that, um, to give you some breathing room, you want to allocate twice the amount of space that you typically take up on the drive, or at least that's what I do. Yep. So here's, here's the issue, right? Time machine will take up all of the store, eventually take up all of the storage that you let it right that that it can see and so the problem is if you've got you know if you've got your 12 terabyte volume you probably don't need 12 terabytes of of time machine and more importantly you probably had some other ideas about what you might want to do with those 12 terabytes of storage so you want to carve out a section of it for time machine and the way Synology has set up to allow you to do that Drobo by the way makes this super easy you just say what do you want your time machine volume called and what do you want the maximum space it's allowed to use to be? And then it, you just tell it, you know, and it, it does it and you point to that volume and it takes care of it. Synology doesn't make it quite that easy. And the way they solve it is what, what you just described, John, which is they're um, using quotas. You set a different user up. And each user has a quota. So you set up Mac mini backup and, and you say, give it, you know, X amount. And then no matter where you choose to store your backup, that particular user can't ever use more than that amount of storage. And that keeps time machine in check. So, yeah, it's a little wonky. They've got a knowledge base article about how to set that up and with screenshots and everything. So I'll, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Yeah. But you're right. Yeah, it's a little it's a little wonky the first time you, you go through it. It's like, oh, it's it's more about understanding the paradigm, right? Is, you know, oh, this is how we accomplish this. Okay. Different ways to skin a cat. So Yeah. yeah. It'd be nice if they could just make a little yeah. wizard to do it. I agree. It's like, okay, name the user, uh, how much space, and then, you know, just create it for you in the background. Yep. Yep. Eh, maybe they'll do that in the next version. Maybe. Um. So both Todd and Mark had asked the same question, which is how to clone or can I clone to a Synology, right? Because we always talk about maintaining a clone using something like Super Duper or a carbon copy cloner. And can you use your Synology as a destination for your clone? And the answer is absolutely yes. But there's a caveat. And the caveat is that you're going to be backing up to a disk image on your Synology because that's the way you do that. And you're not going to boot from a disk image. So if your goal was to have a bootable clone that could connect to any Mac, then this is not the way to do it. But if you just wanted to create a clone and you're okay with the limitations of it being a disk image, then by all means, this is the way to do it. And I actually do this to create archives of things like before I upgrade to Mojave or before, if I'm going to do a nuke and pave, it's like, let me clone this and like put it in cold storage here so that it's, I'm never going to touch it. I'm never going to change it, but here's how that drive existed. And that has saved my butt uh, in the past. In fact, I've started doing those kinds of things at no, no less frequently than once a year, just like cold storage. Here's the entire image of the drive. Great. If this machine dies or if I delete something, I know I can go back and maybe get it. So that's, that's where, so yes, you can, but yes, John. I just thought of something. Uh Oh, <laughs> well, no, well, let me ask you this. So normally a clone has to be a direct connected drive, right? Yeah, I know. I think I know where you're going. I like this. Yeah. Keep tug on this. Yeah. 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 Could I do a net boot? to a disk image because isn't that what's really happening when you do a net boot yes except i don't think you can do it to a disk image on a synology but you might <clears throat> be able to well could you do it to an iSCSI image right so thus far we've been talking about the synology as a file server right where it manages its own storage and then just you know, displays to you files. And, and so when we talk about cloning to a disk image there, we're talking about you're connecting to the Synology using like file sharing, like you would between two Macs. So it's either using uh, probably SMB nowadays, the, you know, this, the, the new way of doing it, but it could be using Apple file protocol. You can turn on both if you want. Um, but there is another way. 
you can carve out a segment of your storage and present it as just raw data to your Mac using a protocol called iSCSI, I-S-C-S-I. And your Mac doesn't support that natively, though, which is why I'm pretty sure you can't boot from an iSCSI partition. But it is treated like a partition to your Mac. Once you put an iSCSI driver on your Mac, you then can just grab, like you could say, okay, great, here's, you know, four terabytes of data. And you can just grab that and you'd format it as, I don't know if you could format it as APFS, but maybe, but you'd format it as a HFS plus, which I've done in the past. And then your Mac is managing it directly. So in theory bootable, but I don't know, can you net boot from Synology? I'm not sure, man. But that's, it's an interesting thought process. I don't know. Yeah. You, yeah. Have you found anybody that that's done it? No, I'll have to, uh, I'll have to search. Yeah, okay. Something to try. Yeah. In theory, it should work. Yeah. <laughs> oh, at least in my mind. I, yeah, I like it. There, there's a link in the Synology forums about bringing a net boot slash net install package to Synology. And mm. um, so I will put that, uh, that thing, but yeah, as Kiwi Graham points out in the chat room, hello, uh, that iSCSI doesn't mount as a network volume, right? It is a, it is a direct, it appears to Mac OS like it's a direct attached device. So you're not sharing it with anyone. It's just like a hard drive that you've got connected via USB or whatever. If you wanted to share it, you'd share it from your Mac, not from your disk station, which is just interesting. So. Uh, yeah, I, this is, I don't know, man. I like this idea. Um, speaking of file systems, where are we on time? Okay. This is a good, a good way to wrap this, this, uh, this up here. Speaking of file systems, there are two that you can use now on Synology. Actually, there's more than two, but there's, there's sort of two main ones, uh, for years and years and years, EXT4 was the file system to use. And then starting a couple of years ago, uh, Synology changed their default file system for most of their NAS devices to BTRFS. This is very similar to what we're talking about between HFS plus and APFS on the Mac. It, it's a very mm -hmm. similar conversation, right? And a lot of the features of BTRFS with snapshots and all that stuff are, you know, m are mirrored with APFS. So it's, it's a very similar conversation. The one big difference that's frustrating to both John and I, longtime Synology users, is that there is no conversion utility to go from EXT4 to BTRFS. So you have to create a new volume uh, that is a BTRFS and copy all your data over. And I have not gone through this headache yet, although I keep thinking about it. But I have tested some, like, I, I, like I've, I've mentioned, I have a couple of different Synology units. My main one is still EXT4 because that's just where it is. But all the others are BTRFS and it, it runs fine. Although I will point out that QNAP has an article where they make it very clear they do not think BTRFS is the right file system. Now, I don't know how much of this is just, you know, propaganda versus facts. Well, it is propaganda. It also has facts. You know, BTRFS, they say, is slower, greater I.O. latency, and that EXT4 is like 60% oh, sure. faster, which is totally true. Um, yeah, well, because they include what else they have, you know, self-healing. I mean, yeah. there's these advanced features, kind of like APFS, and I think that you have the same case with APFS, is that uh, right. it, it, the, the performance is not yet at the same level. And I think even Synology does certain models won't run it because it requires too much horsepower. Too much horsepower. Right yeah, that's exactly right. So it's it's worth looking through this if if you're interested in that. We'll put a link to that in the show notes, but it's it's pretty yeah. interesting. So this I This makes yeah. me sad. I mean, come on, Apple can write a utility to convert from one to the other. <laughs> yeah. Synology people should be able to hire Apple to do it for you. Synology could do it too. I mean, there's smart people I there know. just like there are everywhere, you know, but um yeah, there you go. So <sighs> That's... I mean, I may do it one day. I mean, like I said, I fully back up one to the other. Yep. The thing is, I I'm nervous about. <laughs> yeah, I just erasing I could everything, and then uh oh, right. my uh my backup uh, was was not complete. Oops. Yeah, yeah. I I would the way I would do it is I would like back it up or clone it or however you know you need to get the data over to the new partition. 
And I would do that on a second disc station and get that up and running and all of that. And then here's a, a cool trick, especially going all the way back to where we started this segment with Olga. If you have, say, a two bay Synology um, and you upgrade to a four bay, you can take the two drives out of that two bay and put them into that four bay and then add to that. And it will inherit all of your settings and it's your same deal, which is why I'm still on EXT4, even though I keep upgrading to different units. So uh, so you definitely, you know, could do this by migrating to another unit temporarily and then just take your discs and put them back in. It makes sure you keep the right order. Otherwise, it doesn't it's not happy. But, uh, you know, disc one to one, disc two to two and three to three. Uh, but yeah, then then you could do that. So that would be the other way to do it. But yeah, it's, it's, it just feels like a, I mean, it's, it's like anything. It's just a headache and you know, it's how we go. So uh, I don't know. Man. I do know that it's time to bring the band in my friend. Oh. Well, you know, it's how I it wanted goes. To, we wanted to tell our tales of woe. There's so our many Naz tales of woe. We'll save so that many. for later. We'll have to save our Naz tales of woe for another day. You, well, know? you and I both <laughs> recently had Naz drive meltdown or failures yeah they happen all the time i it's just like it's part of life with the you know i mean they're drives they just they die it's how it works it's why we store our data in in these things with fault tolerance so that when the drive dies we're not losing data it's really not a big deal it's really not a tale of woe right it's hey a drive died i pulled it out i replaced it with another one it the world's good again yay i think i've only had Two failures on my Synology and yeah. one, maybe two on my Drobo. Yeah, yeah, I haven't had many. Yeah, they happen though. I mean, <clears throat> you know, it's it's never a if, it's when, right? So. Oh yeah, and I like I have mine set up. You can say how many bad blocks before you tell me about it, and I set it to one. Yes, <laughs> tell me right away. Yes, because one once one block goes. More, so where do you where do you do that? Follow. You do that in Storage Manager, John? Is that right? Yeah, I think it's storage manager. Okay. Yeah, I think storage manager, you highlight the drive, and then you say, here's the bad block threshold. Really? So I got to configure. Oh, uh, no, that's not there. I don't know. Yeah, here we go. That. Storage manager. I'm going to click on a drive. Let's click on this one. Let's say health info. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's buried in there somewhere. I thought okay. it was under the, uh, the drive. Yeah, this is the oh, let's fun see. Of... No, configure. All right. So yeah, so so hard drive. Then I click on the drive. Then I click on conf no. That's not it. Either. No, that's. I was just gonna say configures not it. Test schedule. No logs. General. Maybe it's general. Ah, there we go. Yeah. So. Um, oh, look at that. In the general tab, you can say send me a health a disk health report. Okay. Bad sector warning. Disk lifespan warning for SSDs yep. only. Yeah. And uh, the smart database. Look at that. So yeah, I set it to one. I think it's off by default, so it's something you might know. Mine is on and is set to 50, so wow. maybe 50 is the default. Oh. So I'll set mine yeah, to one. Kinda and, high. Uh, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I want to know when this thing's going to start to go bad. So cool. All right. Well, there you go, folks. Thank you. Uh, thank you for listening. Thanks, everybody, for everything. We love being able to do this, and we really appreciate your help and all of that stuff. A big shout out, thanks to all of our premium subscribers at macgeekup.com slash premium if you're interested in that we will have a long list of you to thank when we get back and go through the the long list because we're recording this in advance so we can't do the list because we don't know the future yet but now we're in the future but we didn't know you understand Premium at MacGeekUp.com is where all of you who are premium members can email us. Of course, you can call us 224-888-GEEK and John Geek is... Four, three, three, five. And visit our Mac Geek Up forums. Go to MacGeekUp.com slash forums. We'd love to hang out with you over there. Good quality uh, answers, good quality folks, and it's growing, and we love to see it. And we really, it's fun being able to do all this together. Uh, I want to thank Cashfly, C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com for providing all the bandwidth, of course. I want to thank our sponsors, like I said, Barebones dot com ring.com slash mgg 
Smile at smilesoftware.com, linkedin.com slash MGG, maxsales.com, codeweavers.com slash MGG, onepassword.com slash geekgab. John, what, uh, what do you got to say? Any advice for them, for me, for you? You're going to be traveling soon. I think I got some good advice for everybody. It's set your bad block count to one, <laughs> yeah, man. whether it's on your hard drive or your brain, because if you don't, you may get caught. Made up.